<laughs> Hello. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, I have a question. How many, raise your hands, know that the, um, some of the most advanced vehicles on Earth are on farms? Okay, we're good, great. <laughs> you got your people. Yeah. All right, so we're going to start with some introductions. I'm Jennifer Strong. I create audio series, including In Machines We Trust, which is a show about automation. And I'm a journalist director at uh, MIT Technology Review. Guys, you want to go next? Um, I'm Barry Lon. I'm founder and CEO of Provisio, uh, where we're taking a safe approach to autonomy. So we start with the edge cases and why we crash and why accidents happen, and we work towards autonomy. So slightly the opposite direction to everyone else. Yeah. And hi, I'm Praveen Penmetsar. I'm the CEO at Monarch Tractor, where we're building an all-electric, fully autonomous smart tractor and we are targeting the fruits and vegetables market, and our whole mission is to make farmers profitable and then move the food ecosystem to sustainability, because unless the farmers are profitable, it's going to be hard for them to change their operations and focus on sustainability. All right, let's start with some level setting, which is going to be hard because it's uh, not level <laughs> across yeah. all the different forms of automation on a farm, but uh, Praveen, maybe you want to go first. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a good comment, uh, Jennifer, that you and Barry made, right? That there's a lot of technology on farms is our perception. Um, you know, and if you think about big agriculture, right, especially in the Midwest of, uh, of the U.S., where crops such as corn, soy, et cetera, you do see a lot of technology out on the farm. You see these big tractors, um, you know, with GPS positioned autonomy systems yeah. where the driver is more focused on not driving the tractor but the operations. But then amazingly, when you go to the fruits and vegetables farmers, most of whom are smaller, and now we are talking about tens of acres, hundreds of acres, maybe a few thousand acres in yeah. certain areas, there's no technology at all. And the reason for that is they are under tremendous margins pressure to where they cannot invest into that tech. And also it's a harder technology problem that companies yeah. such as Monarch and Barry's are working on solving, right? So there's a huge disparity there. Mm -hmm. And that's the gap that we need to fill. And with some of the latest and greatest tech coming along, there's now for the first time opportunities to put the best of technology into the hands of the smallest farmers who yeah. are growing our food for us. Do you want to add in there? Yeah, no, and I think, I think very similar, I think in agriculture is what you have in the automotive space as well, and almost the levels of autonomy, yeah. probably, we probably shouldn't even address them because it, it's, when is it level five? When does it need to be level five? Or when does it need to be you know, level zero or have? And, and, uh, and I think, but I do think farms are a really good place to try out this type of technology as well because they have some tough conditions, mm -hmm. but they also have some really easy driving, right? right? Like, like straight lines, lots of, lots of that and repetitive things like that. But the, you know, there's, there's a safety issue on farms as well. So I, right. I think for me, it's like you can only have level five when you can absolutely guarantee that that machine will never cause a problem or, or cause an accident on a farm, right? So that's, that's where I think you start to work with farmers, you start to work with what are the problems that you can solve, and that, that, that goes beyond, to me, it goes beyond autonomy, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's another question for everybody. Um, how many folks know that is it the most dangerous work on the earth or pretty close? Yeah, it's the third most dangerous profession in the world is actually agriculture and farming. I'm not sure how many of us are conversant with that, right? Yeah. And it's not just because of things like equipment safety, but it's also because of exposure to chemicals. These are all things that are not conducive to put somebody out in the middle of the farm while you're spraying some of these dangerous chemicals. Uh, the driving seat on a tractor, especially on some of the smaller farms, is the most dangerous place to be on a farm, because that's where most of these accidents happen. But again, after construction and mining, agriculture is the third most dangerous profession on the planet. Right. So maybe the next thing that would be helpful, since you guys do such different things, could you each dig a little bit more into what it is you do precisely before we get back out into the big picture? Yeah. So on my side, that Monarch tractor, what we saw was you know, the lot of our fruits and vegetables farmers were really struggling with three main things, right? Number one is definitely the move towards sustainability was applying even more pressure on them. Yeah. It's hard to go green if your business is in the red. And only 42% of farmers in the U.S. make money. A lot yeah. of fruits and vegetables farmers around the world 
are actually uh, you know, in a poverty condition, right? They're basically just surviving. So for that kind of an ecosystem, for us to transition that uh, into a sustainable farming where they need to invest more, do more, is hard. The second thing that they were struggling with is there's just been an outflow of talent and labor from farming. The average age of farmers around the world is very high. In certain countries, it's now in the high 60s. In Japan, it's around 68 years, right? In, uh, in the US also, it's in the high 50s. So the younger uh, generation is not coming into farming because they see it as a lack of uh, opportunity, yeah. creativity, and profitability. So and the third thing that we are seeing is the lack of data. Right? right. Uh, here's my question is, we all know the name of the DoorDash person that bought you your delivery, but we don't know how our food was grown, when was it harvested, or what happened to it? How many chemicals went into it, right? So we have to bridge this gap between the farmer and the, and the customer. Yeah. We have to make that relevant. So at Monarch Tractor, we built an all-electric tractor so that we can reduce the cost of diesel for the farmers, mm -hmm. autonomous so that they can reduce on labor costs, and smart so that they can use that data to tell their story to the consumer and hopefully make more money uh, and use that to increase their revenues and profits. So that's what we do at Monarch Tractor. That's why it's an all-electric, autonomous, smart yeah. tractor. What we do isn't nearly as cool as that. <laughs> uh, so we, we, we do the perception bit, right? So, so how I ended up in, in this space was autonomy was failing, right? And it was failing because of the edge cases. And the edge yeah. cases are the same reason we all crash and have problems in vehicles, right? Yeah. Weather, uh, you know, not, not being able to see beyond line of sight and that side of things. So that, that's what we build. We build what we consider, obviously, the best perception system in the world that's capable of seeing all these things that you, you couldn't previously see. But the most important bit is we build it at a price point that it can go on any vehicle, right? That was our goal because $250,000 worth of sensors on a, on a vehicle isn't, you know, isn't going to be rolled out ubiquitously, so it isn't going to solve safety on farms, right, if it, if it costs that. So we, we built that at a price point it can go on every vehicle. So that, that's kind of how we've now ended up moving into agriculture. Yeah. So there's, there's a big pull there. Like uh, our main market is automotive. I, I was here with a car last year, so uh, we, we haven't left that space. But there's a real pull in, in this sector because Safety is a big thing for them. Automation is, you know, people want that as well. But the, the stuff you talked about, the data, that's the stuff I find amazing. Like, so it, like for example, like our perception stacks can, can actually do yield analysis and, and tell what, what they're going to get. So there's all this really cool side uh, data that you're getting while you're out there trying to solve the, the safety problem and, and just a automate the farm, right? Yeah. I want to talk about what's hard, and there's a lot of reasons for this to be hard in agriculture, starting with, you know, computers and tech don't love sun, water, heat, mud, you know, uh, and then you think what percentage of farm labor, I think, I don't have recent data, it's probably four years old, but it, it was like 40 something percent of, uh, of labor on a farm didn't use a smartphone at the same time that farms are bringing in CTOs to try to manage across dozens of apps in many cases that, you know, there's no dashboard for yet because we're still early. I mean, there's, I'm speaking in very general terms, there are some, but you know what I mean, it's more or less you're working off an iPad. But what is hard for you, for each of you? What is your biggest challenge right now? I think on our side, it's definitely you know, being able to build hardware that is robust enough, uh, what we call ag-robust at Monarch, mm -hmm. that can survive the elements of the farm. And you brought up a great point is it's, it's much harsher than even what you see on the car side in certain cases. Yeah. Uh, the reason for that is cars have suspensions, reasonably good roads, right? And then you're out on a farm, and there's no suspension on a tractor, so the perception stack has to be really good on the hardware side and on the software side. And the second thing there is you have to work in all conditions, yeah. right? Very often, um, you know, there's things like you, you, the tractor itself is spraying things, right? So there's a cloud of spray, and you have to work 24-7 just because of the time constraints of farming. Right. Uh, but that is also the important part. And the reason I'm excited to be here and why everybody else should be excited too is there's now solutions like companies like ours are getting us onto the farm. We are solving the hard problems of perception, autonomy, and collecting that data on the farm with our hardware, mm -hmm. which now is becoming accessible to the larger group of people to start using, to start creating applications on top. Yeah. So we will 
chuck that data up into the cloud, and now you can start to build applications, and we'll see a whole host of companies coming up. But yeah. the hardest part is on the ground, and that's not something a satellite or a drone can answer. You have to be on the ground on a tractor, so. Yeah, yeah and I think for, for us especially, we, we set up the, the company mm -hmm. to solve the hard bit, right? Yeah. And so we love the misery. We, we love getting stuck into that. So the, for, for, for me and the team on a day-to-day -day basis, that's kind of, the, the hard stuff isn't the hard stuff. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing, for, like we'll talk tech all day, we'll build tech all day, we love it, like we're, we're really into it. The hard bit is, actually achieving the, the price points that need to be get, gotten to in this sector, uh, dealing with big companies. The, the companies are just monstrous, right? They, I mean, it, it's so refreshing uh, to talk to Praveen about Monarch, you know, I started with that attitude, yeah. but like the big boys, um, they're, they're, even themselves, they, they find it hard to un, un, unpack their own organization. In fact, I, I had a meeting with someone yesterday evening and I was explaining to them how their own company worked because they were, they were trying to work out how they could get to another part of that. So that, to me, that's the hard bit, right? Getting, getting, because it's so obvious for us, everyone should have this technology, right? Yeah. So that's the frustration of a founder. You're like, oh, everyone needs it, we're doing it, and we've it at a price point you need, but you've all this red tape to get through, and, and obviously safety critical devices, they have to, you know, you have to go through that process too, but. Well, I think it's important to also point out that um, you know we talk about agriculture like it's one thing. It's very different when you're talking about commodity crops and versus you know, specialty. Specialty crops means like fruits and vegetables, right? right? And there's a lot of technology available for these very large commodity crops. And in part, you think about it, it is easier to teach a machine to know the difference between soy plant, not a soy plant, right? But how do you deal with fruits and vegetables which don't grow in a uniform way around the plant or tree and all these things are different heights? Yeah. We used to make the joke that we're getting closer to figuring out making jet fuel from uh, ice on the moon than we are how to pick an apple you know, with a robot. So I'm wondering um, for you, like, what do you see in this space as next? Yeah, and that's definitely the framing of the problem, Jennifer, that you have done, right? Is all of us care about our fruits and vegetables more. Right. It's also the tougher problem that companies like ours are trying to solve and we need more people to join that movement. Yeah. And what we are seeing there is huge opportunity. The reason for that is our fruits and vegetables markets right, have like five to eight times the number of people are needed for operations yeah. compared to your commodity crops. Also from a data quality standpoint and digital application standpoint, mm -hmm. The great thing is consumers care about where your apples, your blueberries, and your strawberries come from. We don't care that much about where our you know, uh, corn fuel comes from that goes into fueling your car right. or feeding our dairy, right? So yeah. there's a huge digital opportunity here on the data side uh, just because of the inefficiencies in our food production, especially on fruits and vegetables. But that's also a challenging bit because farmers these days are, are pretty compressed on the margin side. Barry made yeah. a great point. You have to bring the cost of those products down. Um, so what we see is it's a dynamic environment. There's no mapping. There's no digital tools. They're very much still in a paper world, which means the opportunity for us to apply technology and show a value on it is tremendous. Yeah. Uh, that's why we are excited about what we're doing. And that's why we are intentionally focused on the fruits and vegetables market and the small farmers around the world. Mm -hmm. And we are also building a platform to enable other companies to write applications on top of our data that we're collecting cool. so that we all can kind of advance food sustainability and make the farmers more profitable. Well, and all the things you lay out m make safety yeah. right, even more important because you're dealing with more people and more variability. Absolutely, and, and different challenges. Like I, I, I don't have that privilege yeah. of being able to say we're, we're going to focus on the, the brute and veg because like, it's determined by the, yeah. the, the OEMs we sell to. It's great being an OEM. Yeah. I, I should have thought of that. I should have gone your way. <laughs> but um, so, so for example, you know, you can go out and build a, a, a perception system and say this is, right. this is great and then we're out harvesting last week and the crop yeah. is five meters high, right? right. So if, if you just go out there with a camera and you go into that five meter high crop, 
you've got nothing, right? You're, yeah. you're selling nothing there. So that creates a whole other set of challenges as well, and that's where kind of radar comes in because radar is actually able to penetrate that, and right. then you're trying to, you know, there's, there's all these weird things that are out there, and I think they're, on, they're completely on tap, so it's right. really nice. It's, like a, it's yeah. like a gold mine, and especially if you're into AI, ML, like yeah. anywhere there's, on top data is, is exciting, so. Well, I, it makes, you can tell I care about that. I grew up in a farming community, I get excited about this issue. I don't understand why they're having a recruiting problem, to be honest, because we all eat. A lot of people drive, but all of us eat, and it just seems like one of the great challenges is so much potential to play. But um, we're going to be wrapping up out of time fairly soon. So before we get too much further, I'd love to ask each of you to talk about what you see as like the next five years for what you're doing. Barry, yeah. uh, you go for it. <laughs> so on our side, I think this is going to be the next big industry to get transform transformed, uh -huh. right? We have seen our automotive industry and the mobility industry get transformed, and yeah. both Barry and I have played roles in helping that transformation. We have seen our energy sector get transformed. We all now are seeing cleaner sources of energy. Yep. And the next big thing, and the reason all of us are now hearing the words food security for the first time, right, and are starting to care about it, is going to lead to the uh, you know, transformation of the food and ag industry, which means there's going to be a tremendous opportunity for technology and technology companies to come in, mm -hmm. and also for new people to come in and new companies will be built here. Yeah. Right? So we see the next five years being the transformation of our food and food ecosystem, which is why I come from the mobility world. I, I, I played roles in the energy world before, mm -hmm. but I'm more excited by the food world than anything else, because you made a great point, Jennifer, right? that all of us eat, yeah. But somehow we have lost our connection to how our food is grown. Yeah. And I think we need to refine that connection. And all of us need to play a role in that. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, uh, and that, like when I hear that, and yeah. th th it's great like getting to speak to people like Praveen, and, and every day you're inspired to go, right, we have got to get this technology into more applications, right? And so we're working in mining, we're working obviously in automotive and all that side as well. And each time yeah. you're seeing Safety is, is critical here. We need, we need to get this technology. So it, it, it's more of a mission than a business decision that you, we just have to get this rolled out. We have got to make this level of perception ubiquitous. And we, we have to solve the farming problem, yeah. right? Because it, it is, we do have uh, food crisis issues and we, we have all that. And, and so I think that, that to me is what excites me over the next number of years is getting to it a ubiquitous uh, nature on, on this technology. Speaking of ubiquity though, what we haven't talked about is who you, each of you partner with. No. So, I mean, because you are doing things that exist today. It's not, these are not PowerPoint companies, so maybe if you want to talk a bit about that. Yeah, that is a, the, the biggest challenge in ag is also, it, it, it's fairly risk averse and it needs to be, right? Like for example, if we deploy a technology at scale and we break all the, the technology on the farm, we're going to pay a price for that on the food prices, food security, and a lot of the, uh, the economies of countries, if you look at the percentages of GDP, are driven by the food and ag world. Yeah. So it's a very risky industry to, to kind of get in there and uh, you know, not be deliberate and thoughtful. Deliberate and thoughtful also means that we have to respect all the players in the ecosystem today and what they bring to the table. Whether it's equipment companies, like Barry's talking about, these very big companies that are there, that's chemical companies, seed companies, retailers, food processors, and of course, the consumers. Right. So we have to work with all of these ecosystem players mm -hmm. in ensuring yeah. that whatever we are doing is in alignment with what they're trying to do. But when I think of the challenge, I'm also uh, excited by the opportunity. Right? There's so many verticals for technology companies and for people to have a role in, right? You can, you can play a role at the retailer, logistics and distribution, you know, food equipment uh, processing, food processing, and you can go all the way back to the farm and play a role on the farming and uh, the growing of the food itself. Yeah. Huge opportunities across the board, but we do have to respect the players there. If you don't respect the retailers or the equipment companies or the seed companies or the, or the input companies, inputs are basically everything from fertilizers to seed companies, right. we'll, we'll pay a price and we can't afford to as a as a growing population. True. 
Anything you want to add there? I, you get the last word, last yeah, 20 seconds. I was, I was happy to let him go there because yeah. I have so many NDAs signed at this stage. I'm not allowed. <laughs> I mean, it's hilarious. All these big guys, no one wants anyone knowing what they're doing. You, you know some of the players in this, yeah, right? Yeah. But, uh, but they're apparently allowed to talk about what we're doing. So I do know, I, I, I've ever worked with class tractors, for example, yeah. because they talked about it. They, they didn't ask me first. Oh. But yeah, but it's those OEMs, the big guys. That's who we're dealing with. Um, I think with that, that's, we're out of time. Unfortunately, yeah. I feel like we could keep on going here, but um, a big round of applause for yeah. our Thanks guests. A lot. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Right. Yeah. Brilliant right, job. Guys.